Good evening, Eastside. Hey, it is really, really good to be here. And I tell you what, I think Dave should write a book, don't you? Yeah. yeah. It is an honor uh, for us to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Dave and Susan have been uh, friends for quite a while. And um, we met them at a dinner with several couples several years ago. And then uh, Dave and I, as he mentioned, are in a cohort together. And uh, I have the greatest respect for your pastor. Uh, he is a man of God. He loves God with all of his heart. He is the real deal. He is a pastor's pastor. He is a leader of leaders. And uh, I believe that you guys are extremely blessed to have the two of them here as your pastors. You ought to maybe give them some love. And somebody told me beforehand that I looked like Neil Lancaster. I can't figure out why. <laughs> the only thing I know is that God made a few perfect heads and the rest he put on hair. <laughs> just saying, just saying. Then I want you to meet my uh, traveling companion, my best friend, Sandy. Would you stand and give her some love too? We've actually been married uh, 49 years this year, and um, we are, I know, I know, I know, we were like 12 when we got married, but uh, she really is my best friend, and I'm honored to have her with me uh, tonight. Let me pray, and I'm going to jump right into this. Father, I am so very, very grateful for who you are and all that you do in our life, and God, just to sense and feel your presence in this place tonight, thank you for this incredible church. And I pray your continued blessings and favor would be upon them and that you would use them in ways they never dreamed possible. Lord, I believe you are just beginning to move through this congregation. And I pray, Father, that you would give them a bold faith like never before to reach this community for Christ. Thank you for Dave and Susan. Thank you for their friendship. And just thank you for the way that they're leading strong and leading well. And I pray that you'd continue to bless them as well. God, I just pray now that as we get into your word tonight that you'd use it to open up our eyes to see and hear all that you want us to do in our lives. We love you and praise you. We just ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So guys, I grew up in a middle-class home with parents that absolutely loved me. And yet I had a father with a whole lot of unresolved anger. I never quite knew when he was going to blow or what it might be that would set him off. It might be a teenager driving down the road too fast and he'd jump up out of his recliner, running outside, cursing and swearing and shaking his fist at the teenager who was long gone. Or it might be we were watching television at night when he was trying to sleep and we had the TV too loud and he'd come busting out of his bedroom door cursing and swearing, telling us to turn down the television. Whatever it was, whenever it happened, things got loud and the expletives began to fly. These outbursts of anger created a whole lot of different emotions in me as a kid. Everything from fear to embarrassment to, well, making me angry over his anger. I remember on one occasion, I think I was about 11 years old and I was going somewhere with him where I was riding shotgun and something caught my dad's eye, and so he didn't notice the car in front of him had stopped, and so he rear-ends that car. His first response is to immediately turn to me and curse and swearing because I didn't tell him to stop the car. Something had obviously happened in my father's life long before he got in the car that day. I don't mean minutes or hours before, I mean years before. There had to be some injustice in his life that was totally unrelated to that fender bender, some hurt or offense that never got resolved, and so it left him responding to every perceived injustice with anger. After a while, that anger became so much a part of his life, he didn't even notice the damage it was doing to the people that he loved the most. Now, fortunately for me, the story ends on a much happier note because in my teenage years, my father discovered a relationship with Jesus Christ, and it radically changed him. From that moment on, he went out of his way to make sure that I knew that he loved me and that he was proud of me. He went out of his way to serve God in our local church. He loved the Lord. I'm not telling you, listen, I'm not telling you that he never got angry again because like all of us, there were things that upset him. 
but I do believe he worked really hard to break the habit of responding to every difficult situation with anger. So guys, as you heard, I wrote a book called Creatures of Habit, Breaking the Habits Holding Us Back from God's Best. What I discovered when I was doing research for this book is that most of us greatly underestimate the power of habits in our life. For instance, did you know that 40%, now wrap your brain around this, 40% of everything you do during a day, that's almost half, 40% of everything you do during a day is done out of habit. In other words, it's second nature. You don't even give it a thought. Maybe it's typing on a keyboard. Maybe it's playing a, a musical instrument. Maybe it's driving home from work. I remember when my grandfather, when they moved uh, to a new home, for the first three nights after work, he kept driving back to the old house. And then he realized that's not where I live anymore. So those are habits that we create in our life. So what is a habit? A habit is a simple choice that you and I make Now listen, when it's repeated enough times, it becomes an unconscious pattern. I want you to remember that. I'm going to refer back to it in just a second. When it's repeated enough times, it becomes an unconscious pattern. And those habits then become our identity. In other words, we become known by the habits in our life, good or bad. That's how people recognize us. For instance, let's say... Let's say that um, somebody asked me, you and I, we're all friends, and somebody asked me to introduce you to them. And what I know about you is that you are as honest as the day is long, but you tend to complain just a little bit. How am I gonna introduce you? I'm gonna say, oh my gosh, she's the most honest individual you'll ever meet. She does tend to complain just a little bit, but she's really honest. What have I done? I've introduced you and identified you by the habits that are in your life. And you guys, that's why it's so important that we create good habits in our life. You say, yeah, but Steve, how do we know if it's a good habit or a bad habit? Oh, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. Good habits, good habits reinforce your desire to be like Christ. Good habits reinforce your desire to be Christ-like. The Bible calls those spiritual disciplines. So a spiritual discipline is actually a good habit in your life, and it becomes a stepping stone spiritually. In other words, those good habits, those spiritual disciplines in our life are the things that help us to grow and to become more Christ-like, to become more like Jesus. Bad habits. Bad habits, on the other hand, are the things that conflict with us being Christ-like. Bad habits are the things that conflict with us being like Christ designed us to be. Those are not spiritual disciplines. The Bible identifies those as spiritual strongholds. Those are the things that get a hold on you. Those are the things that get a grip on you. Those are the things that keep you from being like Jesus. And they're certainly not stepping stones. If anything, they're a tombstone. If anything, they're a death to the purpose and the plan that God has for your life. Now, when I did research for this uh, book, I found the scripture has a whole lot more to say about habits than I ever uh, realized it did. And I, I could spend the whole evening just talking about the different scripture passages that deal with the topic of habits, but my favorite, I think, is Romans chapter 12, verse two. I think it'll be right up here on the screen. Romans 12, 2, Paul writes, and I know you're familiar with the verse, he says what? Do not conform. What does it mean to conform? To conform is to take the shape of something. Paul writes them and says, do not conform, do not take the shape to the pattern of this world. What did we say a habit was? A habit is an unconscious pattern. It's patterns in your life. So don't conform to the pattern, to the habits of this world, but instead... We need to be transformed. What does that mean? That means to be completely changed. How are you changed? By the renewing of your mind. A habit is a mindset. It's a mindset. You're trying to change your mindset. You're trying to change from a bad habit and replace it with a good habit. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Listen. 
Before you invited Jesus Christ to come into your life, the scripture makes it clear that sin had a grip on you. Before you were a Christian, sin had a hold on your life. It had a grip on your life. But then when you invited Jesus Christ to come into your life, he broke that hold. He broke that grip. In fact, the scripture tells us clearly that God gave you the power to now say no to sin. But Christians say to me all the time, they say, Steve, I've been a believer for five years. I've been a Christian for 10 years, and I still feel stuck. Why is that? Because just because you invite Jesus Christ in your life, he now gives you the power to say no to sin, but you've got to make a decision, an intentional decision to do something about the bad habits in your life. They're not going to just disappear. They're not going to just go away. You have to be the one that does something about it. So thus is the reason I wrote the book. I believe this book will help you. I believe, obviously, I believe that it's more than a book. It's like a workbook. In other words, first, the way I came up with this, I came up with a list of 40 bad habits. And I said, okay, which ones do I want to deal with? And I thought, I'm going to pull out the ones that I personally struggled with at one time or another. So I pulled out 12 bad habits, and I said, those are the ones that I'm going to research. Those are the ones I'm going to uh, talk about because I've personally dealt with them. I know how difficult they can be. And so... uh, In there, in each chapter, each bad habit, I I talk about the habit, then I give you some steps that you need to take if you want to break that habit in your life. So some people say, well, Steve, the only problem is I just don't like to read. Well, can I just encourage you? If you get a book like this, pick the chapter that is specific to you a habit that you're struggling with, and just spend one year going through that, working those steps to break that habit once and for all. And then let's say six months from now, it starts to come back, go right back to that chapter and start working those steps again. Now, this works great for Bible studies. Uh, You just deal with a chapter each week. It works great for small groups. And um, I'd be honored, if you want one, I would be honored to sign your book after the service. I'll be out there. But today, what I want us to do is I want us to talk about the habit of anger. But I think it's important, before I jump into this, to mention that anger is not always a bad thing. In fact, anger, guys, think about it, anger is a God-given emotion. It's when it becomes a habit or the way we automatically respond to things, that's when it becomes a problem. Let me give you an example. It's like how this gets started in our life is let's say you say something to me to offend me, and I just lay into you. I just rail on you, and I walk away, and I think, that felt good. And then tomorrow, somebody else over here says something to me to hurt my feelings, and my first thought is, It felt really good to let them have it. I think I'll let you have it, and I blast you. And before I know it, it just becomes the way I respond to every situation I don't like. Now, I believe that every person in this room knows of someone that's just an angry person. Every one of us, we're living in an angry world. I don't think I have to convince you of that. We're seeing it everywhere we go. Anger is on the rise dramatically. And so we all know of people that are struggling with the habit of anger in their life. Anger was designed by God to help us deal with any threat that might come into our life. But it becomes a problem when you lose control of your words or your actions. For instance, don't we all know that Jesus got angry? Sure, Remember, he ran the money changers out of the temple. The merchants were turning religion into a money-making scam, and that ticked him off. I think, honestly, there's other things that anger Jesus. Any kind of injustice angers God. I think it angers God to see an adult harm a child. And yet, even though Jesus got angry, this is important, even though Jesus got angry, the Scripture makes it clear he never sinned. He never sinned. Sin. The type of anger that Jesus demonstrated was more of a righteous indignation. He got angry. Listen, he got angry at the actions of those that acted contrary to God's standard of right and wrong, his standard of fairness, justice, and goodness. This type of anger is directed more at the wrong that is done, not so much towards the person involved. In fact, it's this kind of anger that's produced great movements in our country today. An example would be MAD, 
Mothers against drunk driving. Their anger over the loss of their children motivated them to do something about it by creating one of the largest victim advocate groups in America today. On the other hand, anger is an emotion that many of us experience when the things in our world are not going the way we want them to go. Maybe you've been working towards a promotion at work, but it goes to somebody else and that just ticks you off. Maybe you tell your kids to clean their room and they just ignore you and that makes you so angry. Again, if anger, listen, if anger becomes your immediate response every time you don't like something, then you establish a habit of anger. And it has the potential, guys, it has the potential to hurt your health, to wreck your peace of mind, to destroy your relationships, and even threaten your career. I cannot tell you, because I seriously don't know, I cannot tell you how many jobs my father went through as I was a kid growing up. I can remember him coming home over and over again, telling my mother he'd been fired once again because he got angry at his boss or got angry at a fellow employee. Listen, I once brought in, uh, several years ago, I brought in psychologist and author Dr. Richard Dobbins to speak to a men's group. And there were probably 600 guys in the room. And he, I remember it well when he walked up in front of them and he looked at these guys and he said, gentlemen, men struggle with three issues. Sexual issues, anger issues, and you lie about the first two. Anger has become an epidemic in America today. You see signs of our nation's irritability everywhere you go. The polarization of our political system, I mean, we could talk a lot about that. The everyday nastiness of the online world. The cancel culture has gotten out of control. Or even worse is the workplace or school shootings. Guys, it's gotten so bad, we're afraid to lock eyes with anyone and fear they're gonna pull out a gun and shoot us. And yet most violence, hear me on this, most violence in America today is not random. Most violence in America today is by someone you know. For instance, the American SPCC says there's over 4 million child abuse cases reported every year. 4 million reported. You start to think about how many go unreported of child abuse cases. But most all of those cases are by angry, out-of-control parents. Friends, nobody's born with anger issues. You know, it's like if I came up here with this little infant baby and you say, oh my gosh, she's just so sweet, she's so cute. And I'm like, no, no, this one's got anger issues. I mean, it's just, it's just silly. It's ridiculous because you're not born with anger issues. You need, you need to control, listen to me, moms and dads. You need to learn to control your anger in front of your kids because it is learned behavior. Psychologists have called our generation the age of rage. It's become so common that we've created our own rage vocabulary. For instance, there's road rage. I don't have to explain that. You've all either seen it or experienced it. There's checkout rage in a store. There is phone rage when you're put on hold for an extended length of time. We even see it in recreational activities such as golf rage. Uh, It's a thing. (laughs) (laughs) Several years ago, I was playing golf with, uh, there's four of us, three other pastors, and uh, we were out playing, and the one pastor was just, he was having a rough day. I mean, every. He was hooking at it. He was, it was going everywhere but where he wanted it to go. And so at one point, he comes up to the ball, and he hits it and plop right in the pond, and he lost it. And he took his club and swung it over his head and threw it into the pond. Awkward. And then <laughs> the rest of us just kind of, nobody talked anymore. We just kind of got in our carts and went on to the next, uh, to the next hole. And he's playing And then all of a sudden on this next hole, he stopped and he goes, I'll be back. And he gets in his golf cart and he goes back to that pond and he wades out into that murky water and he finds his club and he comes back and he's muddy from here on down and he plays that way uh, the rest of the day. Proverbs 14, 29 says, people with understanding control their anger. A hot temper shows great foolishness. Some of you might try to argue and push back with what I'm saying and say, Steve, I... 
I don't care what you say. I just cannot control my anger. I'm going to push back and say, well, you might not be able to control the situation or you might not be able to control how it makes you feel. You certainly can control how you express your anger. It reminds me of a story that I read a few years back. It's said to be a true story. I don't know. But you know how in some countries they have these outdoor passion plays. And in this particular passion play, uh, they, the whole community was involved in this. And they would they used this one road as the Via Della Rosa. And, and so the guy playing Jesus had his cross. And he was carrying the cross. And he was going up the road. And this particular, the, the audience is all along the streets watching this. And so he's going up, and this, this particular day, he had a heckler. And this heckler wasn't just staying there yelling at him. He was walking along as Jesus walked the whole time just heckling and giving him a hard time. And he just went on and on and on, and he was abusive. And finally, Jesus, the guy playing Jesus has taken all he can take, and he puts down the cross, and he goes over to the guy, and he punches him in the nose. And then he comes back, and he picks up the cross, and he heads on. Well, afterwards, the director comes up to him, and he says, what are you doing? He said, he said I know that guy had to make you mad, but I can't have my actors uh, assaulting the audience, especially the one playing Jesus. And he's like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. He said, I just lost my cool. He was so rude, and I'll never let it happen again. He said, you better not let it happen again. Day two, same scenario, same situation, same heckler. He's back. He's carrying it. The guy's just as abusive, probably more abusive, sets down the cross, goes over, hits him in the face again, comes and picks up the cross. The, the guy said, you're done. You're fired. Uh, I can't have you on my set. And he said, man, if you fire me, no one in this area will ever hire me again. You've got to give me one more chance. And the guy said, I'm going to give you one more chance, but I'm telling you, if you do anything like that again, don't even come find me. Just get your stuff and leave, and I promise you, I'll make sure that you never work in this town again. It'll never happen. Day three, same scenario, carrying the cross, same heckler. He's more abusive, more rude. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops, and he's, he's clenching his fist. He's gritting his teeth. And he finally, he stops, and he looks at this guy, and he points at him, and he said, I'll meet you after the resurrection. And then he goes on. <laughs> <clears throat> Friends, if we don't learn to control our anger, we will never be like Jesus. Some of you try to use anger to motivate people to action. You yell at your kids to motivate their behavior. You yell at the sales clerk to motivate her to help you. You yell at your employees to motivate them to work harder. And you know what? It works, at least in the short term. You can scare people into doing almost anything. But guys, in the long run, you are always going to lose. Because anger, think with me, anger always alienates people. Isn't that true? I mean, seriously, when people are angry and shouting at you, if somebody comes up to you and they're angry at you and they're in your face and they're shouting at you, does that just endear you to them? Do you just want to go give them a hug? No. You, you're, you put your hand up and you're like, get away from me. I don't want to hear this. And you walk away from them or you push them away from him. Listen, if you are a parent and you're using anger to motivate your kids, Moms and dads, you are actually pushing your kids away. When, you, when your kids were young, they thought you were a superhero. Everyone else might think you're a bit quirky. Maybe everybody else thinks you're a bit odd, not your kids. They think you can do no wrong. Their spirits, their little spirits are wide open to you. But if you continue, listen to me please, if you continue to demonstrate anger to your kids, you're going to watch their spirit close down. Hear me, moms and dads. You're going to watch their spirits close down. Now, they don't have a choice. They have to live under your roof, but their spirit will be close to you. And what do we want to do, moms and dads? We want to say, oh, it's just a generation gap, just the way kids are today. No, it's not the way kids are today. What's happened is that you have closed down their spirit. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, he said, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Guys, if you struggle with the habit of anger, you may feel like there's nothing you can do, but you have more control over your anger than you think you do. 
You want to, you, if their spirits are closed, you can get their spirits to open back up. But it's going to first take uh, you dealing with the anger in your life once and for all. You can learn to express your emotions without losing control. So today, I want to give you a few steps that you can use to break this habit of anger in your life. But guys, let me say this before we get into these steps. Hear me, please. If, if you, you say, Steve, I've worked your steps. I, I have a, a habit of anger in my life, and I worked the steps, and it didn't work. I, I still have anger issues. Guys, then you need to get professional help. Seriously, you need to find a counselor that specializes in anger to help you do this. Because if you don't, you're going to come to the end of your life and the people you love the most are not going to be there. You're going to come to the end of your life and the people that you care the most about, the ones that are still there, are there out of obligation because their spirits are closed as well. Everybody in your world, their spirit will be closed down. You say, well, I don't know what to do. You know, Steve, at my age, it's too late for me. It's never too late for you. You can start by first repenting to them and say, look, I know that I have demonstrated anger to you all of your life, and I need to first ask you to forgive me for that. And then second, I want you to know that I'm gonna get a counselor. I'm getting a counselor, I'm getting help. Now, they may be a little skeptical, but that'll be the first sign of them opening their spirit at all when you say you're getting help for this. Guys, you don't want to get to the end of your life and have those kinds of regrets. You need to make up your mind that once and for all you're going to deal with this. Now, we often try to excuse our behavior by blaming others for our anger. Well, you know, Steve, it's those kids of mine that make me so mad, or my coworkers make me so angry. If she wouldn't have said that, I wouldn't have lost my temper. Listen, before you ever break the habit of anger, you have to take responsibility. You have to own it. I told you, I wrote all these 12 chapters, and the reason I dealt with them is because I owned all 12 of them. I acknowledged that they were a problem for me. So I was able to work on them because, first of all, I owned them. So let me give you some steps to break this habit of anger real, real fast. Number one, identify the source of your anger. If you have a habit of losing control over every perceived injustice, then guys, you need to figure out what's really behind your anger because anger is rarely the primary problem. In other words, it's usually the result of a much deeper problem such as pride or hurt or insecurity or embarrassment. But once I understand what's behind my anger, then I'm more likely to resolve it. For example, physical or emotional pain can bring anger out in us. When I was in my 30s, the decade of my 30s, all of a sudden I had unexplained muscle and joint pain, severe. Went to all kinds of doctors. They put labels on it like fibromyalgia and all other kind. One doctor called it right. He said, I think it's just stress in your life. But what, it, it didn't matter. Nobody was able to really diagnose it. And all I know is that I was in severe pain all the time. And because of it, I had a short fuse with everybody. I had a short fuse with my staff. I had a short fuse with my family because I was angry over the pain in my life. Listen, I found the more, the more I hurt, the more impatient and quick to lose my temper I was. Maybe somebody hurt you emotionally. Maybe somebody you love has rejected you or walked away from you, and it has left you hurting. And so because of it, anger is on a short fuse for you. I'm just saying, guys, if you can identify the source of your anger, you're more likely to understand how to deal with it. Number two, learn to calm down before you react. When you start to feel those emotions of anger rising up, take a few minutes to step away and collect your thoughts. Here's the advantage. Out of all the emotions that we experience, the advantage of anger is it's one that you can feel. You can, when I start to get angry, I feel it in my gut, don't I? You feel it and it starts to rise. Guys, when you get to that and you start to feel anger begin to rise within you, that's the moment to say, uh uh, this is not happening. I'm stepping away. And you step away from, from your spouse or you step away from your kids and say, you know what? We're going to talk about this later. I'll come back after I calm down but you refuse to get in a dialogue with somebody with anger up to here. You walk away, you calm down, and then you come back. Asking yourself, self-talk can be so very, very effective. Is it really worth getting this upset over? Will my anger really solve anything? No. 
Proverbs 29, 11, fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. In other words, guys, think before you speak. Put your mind in gear before you put your mouth in motion. I've heard it said, I've never regretted silence, but I've often regretted what I spoke. James chapter one, verse 19. James is such an incredible chapter because James just says it the way he thinks. He just lays it out there. And he says in the 19th verse, you must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. That's a great verse for your refrigerator. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Number three, get some exercise. You say, Steve, what does that have to do with anger? Seriously, it helps to take a walk. It helps to go to the gym. Whatever you need to do to reduce your anger stress level. Experts say that exercise helps increase the release of endorphins in our body, which is a stress buster. It releases and lowers our stress level. Number four, let go of my anger correctly. Oh, guys, I could spend the whole time talking about this one. There's a lot that could be said about it, but just decide you're not going to handle your anger in inappropriate ways. For instance, don't repress your anger. See, here's, here's a problem. As Christians, we think that's what we're supposed to do. I'm a Christian, and so if I'm angry, my responsibility is to repress it. My responsibility is to shove it down. Absolutely not, because your anger is always going to find a way to be expressed. Sometimes with sarcasm, some of you think you're pretty witty with your sarcasm, but it's actually coming from repressed anger. Some of you try to manipulate to get your own way. Others of you have a vindictive spirit. I don't get mad, I just get even. Listen guys, whether you complain, blame, or criticize, people that are negative are usually trying to repress their anger. But friends, anger will always find a way of release. By the way, there's a word for oppressed anger, and the word is depression. Depression is often frozen rage, repressed anger. And yet on the flip side, you can't just express your anger with violent, abusive reactions or verbal abuse. That was my dad. When you do, you leave burn marks on everyone in your path. You just explode, and you do harm to everyone around you. One pastor said, we often act like a skunk. We spray our stinking temper on anyone that gets in our way. Number five, practice forgiveness. Oh, again, I could say a lot more about this. Forgiveness, unforgiveness is a bad habit. Forgiveness is a good habit. You want to create a habit of forgiveness in your life, that that just becomes second nature for you. Jesus was unjustly beaten and mocked. They placed a crown of thorns on his head, and they nailed his hands and feet to a wooden cross. If anyone had the right to be angry, don't you think it was Jesus? And yet, do you remember what he said? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Guys, if you really want to get rid of your anger, you have to decide you're going to forgive the person that's done you wrong. Now you say, well, you know, I try to forgive them, but then tomorrow I pick it back up. That's right. That's how you break a bad habit. I lay it down, and if tomorrow I pick it up, I lay it down again, and I continue to lay it down until I've let that thing go once and for all. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive just as the Lord forgave you. Lewis Smedes once wrote, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover the prisoner is you. And yet forgiveness is a process. And while it might take time to let it go, guys, you can forgive that person that wronged you. I'm not telling you it's easy. None of this stuff is easy. It takes intentionality on all of it. But you can break that in your life. Number six, give your anger an, expir an expiration date. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 4, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. In other words, don't let a 24-hour period pass by and you still hold on to unresolved anger. There are some of you in this room, if you're honest, you've been holding on to anger for months if you're honest, some of you have been holding on to anger for decades, most all of your life. When you allow angry emotions to accumulate over time, like a pressure cooker, it will eventually explode in destructive and inappropriate ways that will only hurt the people that you love the most. And guys, it will leave you with all kinds of regrets. Number seven, rely on God's control. Seriously. If you really do believe, now think with me, if you really do believe that God has a plan for your life, you will experience contentment and peace. I, I, I've got to share this example with you. I shared this with our church, and I, it's helpful. I wish I had it up here. I had, 
I had um, my stage crew at home build me two white pillars. And on one pillar, they wrote the word goodness up and down. And on the other white pillar, they wrote the word control. And I said, as long as I stand between these two pillars, then I'm going to experience peace and contentment in my life. As long as I believe that God is a good God that absolutely loves me, as long as I believe that God's still on the throne and in control, then I'm going to experience peace in my life. When I step outside these pillars, that's where the problems come in. So when I step out here and I say, you know what, um, I, I believe that God uh, is in control. I believe he's on the throne, but I, I don't know if he loves me. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. When that happens, peace and contentment begin to go down. Worry, fear, and anger begin to rise. Or maybe it's over here. I know God loves me, but guys, look at the state of the world we're in. I don't know if he's still in control or not. Fear and worry begin to climb and peace and contentment begin to go down. So as a Christian, if you say you, say you believe the scripture is true, if we really believe it's true, then we have to stand on that truth. We have to stand between those two pillars of Scripture and say, I believe that he's on the throne, and I believe that he's a good God that loves me and has the best for me. And I may not fully understand what's happening right now in my life. I may not fully understand why things aren't working the way I want them to work. But you know what? I know God has my back. And I know that he loves me. And that, my friends, when you can stand between those two pillars, you will live a Christian life with peace and contentment. God has a plan for my life. I may not understand, but I trust him. Listen, anger is not something you can prevent. Every one of us are gonna have things that disappoint us. We're all gonna have things that frustrate us. They're all, we're all gonna have things that are gonna make us, well, a bit angry. But as long as you keep it under control, and stand between those two pillars and don't allow it to become a habit or a pattern, you will experience more peace and healthier relationships than you could ever begin to imagine. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads with me, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a minute. Don't look around. No one looking around. I just wanna ask a simple question. How many of you, nobody's looking, how many of you would raise a hand and say, Steve, I struggle with anger issues in my life. I want you to put your hand up and then put it back down. Yeah. I mean, all over the room. There's so many of you that struggle with anger issues. Uh, I'm going to take time to do this. I feel led to do it. I want everyone in this room, and those that raised your hands and those that didn't, I want everybody to take your hands and cup them in front of you like you're trying to hold water. Everybody hold your hands in front of you like you're trying to hold water. And I want you to imagine right now you, say, you putting your anger in the palms of your hand. And I want to pray for you. Father, I thank and I praise you for your faithfulness. And I thank you, God, that he who is in us is greater than he's in the world. And Lord Jesus, I know it's not your desire that any of us carry this habit of anger in our life. And so I pray for every single person that raised their hand. I pray for every single person in this room that right now, God, we want to turn this over to you. We want to release it. We are putting it in the palms of our hands right now and giving it over to you. Now I want you just to turn your hands over and dump it out. Just let it go. Let it go once and for all. Father, I thank you and I praise you for what you've done. And I thank you, Lord God, that you have set us free. And I thank you, Lord, that you will give me the power that I need to break this habit of anger once and for all in my life. Thank you, God. Lord, I praise you and, I, and ask, Lord God, for those especially that raise their hands, that you would just continue to do a good thing in each of their lives and help them to be intentional to take the necessary steps to break this anger. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Eastside. Love you.